That's kooky talk. You guys keep acting like, oh, he's going to do it. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Taste Like Music. I'm Jason, joined, as always, by Joe and Kramzer. Today, we are ranking the 17 studio albums of Fleetwood Mac. If you're unaware or you're new to the channel, uh, back in October, we posted a poll where each of us chose an artist from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s and put them up against each other anonymously. And Joe's four picks won. So last week, we did his 60s choice, the Mamas and the Papas. This week, we've got his 70s selection, which I believe is the artist that put him over the top and gave him the win. Fleetwood Mac, very interesting discography, all kinds of lineup changes and different sounds throughout their history. Should be very interesting to rank and see how we feel about all of the different eras. And if you are new here, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe before we get into it. Um, so 17 albums there's a couple, uh, one called English Rose that is not an official studio album. It was some kind of like repackaging for US release. There's some new songs on it, plus like half of Mr. Wonderful. So we're not counting that one. The other one is Pious Bird of Good Omen. That one is also a compilation, not an official studio album. So like I said, 17. Uh, quickly, before we get into the rankings, as we often do, with large discographies, we're going to break it up a little at the bottom. We're each going to go through and give you the bottom four. Then we're going to give you the next three. And then we're going to go one by one through the top 10. For me, as far as my experience with Fleetwood Mac goes, it's kind of spotty. I know um, pretty much all the Buckingham Knicks stuff. I actually saw the time lineup with Becca Bramlett and Dave Mason live. Um, my dad got free tickets to that concert and we went at the last minute. They were with, uh, Pat Benatar and REO Speedwagon. And, uh, I do know I've listened to Penguin and Mystery to Me and then Play On before as well. I'm not real sure if I've heard any of the other ones before. So, uh, a lot of gaps in, in what I had listened to in the past. Uh, how about you guys? A lot of gaps too. Just the classic five lineup is the only one I knew before. So going through this, no, and those five, I know really well. So I really just kind of re-skimmed. Um, so everything else got two spins and uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. Well, for a band that I picked for my pick, I didn't know them very well at all. Other than the classic lineup with uh, Lizzie Buckingham and Stevie Nicks and Christine V from Fleetwood Mac to Tango in the Night. Those are really the only ones I'd heard. So I had huge gaps on both sides of my Fleetwood Mac knowledge. Uh, but I knew people wanted to hear them, and I knew it was a trump card to play against your lists. So I played it, and I'm glad I did. Just such an interesting band with all the lineup changes and the drama and everything. Uh, we've done bands like Yes, where there's you know new members in every album, it seems like. And this is another one where just like listing the people on each album is going to take up like half the time of talking about some of these stinkers. So should be a fun show. I also think, spoiler alert for me and Jason, we're going to have a bit of a Clarence White moment again for this band. So I, I might have a couple Clarence Whites in the, in the Fleetwood Mac uh, discography. Um, so bottom four, let's get started. Who wants to kick it off? All right. Unfortunately, there were several contenders for the bottom spot, but I am going with time and I'm giving it one star. This is an awful record. Be careful what you're saying. You're talking to my heart. There's some good cheese and there's some bad cheese. And that one is the latter. It's a terrible sounding album. It's got terribly adult contemporary pop country vibes. The drum sound on this album seems like it was done by a completely different set of band members and um, producers. It doesn't sound like it belongs on this record at all. Hollywood is a dreadful song. Every song is like a soft country rock song for like Dennis Office in the South in the 80s. It's really bizarre. Um, it's just so tacky. Blow by Blow is like one of the tough, terrible, it's very trite. Saving Grace on this album for not going below one star is probably the song Dreaming the Dream and I Wonder Why. Those are okay. And then they close with These Strange Times, which is totally out of their element. It had no business being in their catalog or on this album. So that's my number 17. 
We're going to go at number 16, bumping up a half star to 1.5 behind the mask. You know, right off the bat, you're in different land with Fleetwood Mac with those key tones. You got Vito and Burnett coming in to replace Lindsay, and it's much more of a soft rock album than Tango in the Night, which is already going in that direction in the first place. Starts with Sky's the Limit, really fluffy and lame. Then we're getting this posh attitude, mega country vibes, stadium country vibes with Love is Dangerous. It's not what I want from Fleetwood Mac. Well, I don't really hate it. Um, my dad would turn over in his grave if he heard me give it a, just a little bit of praise. Um, and you get a song like with Billy Burnett singing uh, in the back of my mind as the first new singer for Fleetwood. It's not bad, but none of it quite feels the same. Do You Now is not great. It almost has like P Peter Cetera vibes. It just like, none of it seems natural. It all seems really forced and overly polished and saturated and cheesy insincerity. Um, Save Me is really dorky and sounds terrible. When the sun goes down is awful. Nothing, nothing on the back half is memorable here. And I just don't understand the choice of like losing Lindsay and not just doubling down, still having Stevie and Christy. They're like, no, let's give Vito and Burnett like half the album to work with. It's like, why? And they have very plain vanilla voices. None of it is working for me. My number 15, still at 1.5. This will probably piss off some people, but I got Mr. Wonderful. I'm all for blues, you know, and just because it's blues and old school guitar playing doesn't mean it's automatically a good album, especially when you get four songs that have the same goddamn blues riff to start off. I mean, that's the thing. I don't want to steal your guys' thunder because I know we're all going to talk about how literally there's like three songs, maybe four songs that all start off the exact same it's so bizarre it's like they had pro tools before pro tools are just like copy and paste that on tracks five through eight over here so stupid and then finally i am going to go up to two stars for my number 14 say you will first song on the album welcome to 2003 in the land of ugly production i think this album is a great example of production ruining it i don't think the material on here is that bad and I'll even go to far as far to say, like, it's some of the best playing they've had on an album in like decades. Like they feel a little reinvigorated. You get Lindsay, you know, doing some of his classic like acoustic work. Um, but there's just like terrible decisions in the studio room on almost every song. Murrow turning over in his grave. It's just some bizarre ass choices of vocal styling. There's some decent stuff like Miranda's not bad. Red Rover's kind of cool, but yeah, they just ruined a lot of what could have been a decent album. Not a great album. It could have been decent, pretty good, but they just messed it up royally. So those are my bottom four. It's better. All right. Well, that's interesting. Pretty much most of the same picks anyway. Although I have mine higher scored. I don't go quite as down far as you because even the the least of them which i have number 17 time i have it at two stars which is pretty much as low as i'll go for any sort of like put together actually produced major label record uh, it is very middle of the road like adult contemporary i like how you were talking about sort of arena country like it's not country but it has some of those same like overtones and production choices uh it reminds me of like billy joel uh, like Stormfront, something like that, where it's like so processed that it doesn't really sound like real instruments anymore. I think Dave Mason, uh, his addition does nothing. Like he's the traffic guy. He should be, you know, adding something interesting to the, the scene. He adds nothing. I think the most interesting person on this whole album is Becca Bramlett, uh, whose vocals on Winds of Change and Nothing Without You are probably the best parts of the whole album. Uh, I think McVie pretty much phones it in with her songs. Number uh, 16, I have Mr. Wonderful. I agree with Kramzer on everything, just really sort of boring blues that, you know, just recycles the same thing over and over again. Production's a lot murkier than on the first one. I don't know if that was like a stylistic choice to be like more Delta blues sounding or something, but it just makes the whole thing sort of I don't know, just not as crisp and sort of that British blues that they really kind of nailed on the first album. Number 15, I have Say You Will. 
And I agree with Kramzer again, especially on the production choices. I mean, you have someone like Lindsey Buckingham, who's such an interesting guitarist, and his guitar tone is just completely ruined. Like they run it through like six different Pro Tools or whatever. And it's just like that really unnatural sounding like steel acoustic guitar. And it just sounds awful. I don't even want to listen to it, especially if you like go back and listen to like Mirage or something or Tusk and then listen to this. Like, it's just like, why can't you just do that again? Like that is the sound, that is the, the noise, the tone. And despite that, the playing's good. I think Stevie Nicks's songs are pretty good. I think she sounds decent. You know, she's had her cocaine and drug problems and her voice is kind of shot, but they, they make her sound pretty good on this one. Say You Will, Running Through the Garden, I think are pretty solid Stevie Nicks songs, uh, but it's 80 minutes long. So it's way, way too long. Uh, I give it three stars because it's, it's fine. That's a very average score for me. Uh, number 14, I have Killin' House which is probably the most out there of all of these uh, records. It's sort of a weird lineup that's only together for like one album, I guess. I'm not even sure exactly who's on this one. Peter Green's gone. They bring on that kind of jokey 50s obsessed rock guy and Christine McVie kind of has more stuff going on. She's, I don't think she's an official member of the band yet, but she does some backing vocals, piano. She drew the cover, which is pretty cool. Um, but I don't know, I, there's something just about it that didn't quite click for me, probably because it's, again, a, a different lineup. This one, Jeremy Spencer is the guy, uh, along with Danny Kerwin, who was here from the last album, then Play On. So it's just a weird like mix of people that don't quite fit together. And Spencer would be gone pretty soon after this. So I'm not sure what the hell's going on, but I just didn't, didn't like it. It's, just, it's a weird kind of uneasy mix of like almost parody 50s songs and like the blues rock that Fleetwood was doing. So I don't know, it's kind of weirded me out. This one felt unnatural. Uh, three stars. My number 17 is Time. I think it's obvious. I didn't want to put it last, but. When I got why? to it, why didn't you want to put it last? This is I why had, people come at you for being contrarian. No, 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 no. I had in my mind, like I, I did see the lineup live, and my dad owned it, so I know I'd heard it in the past, and I had kind of some memories of it, although I didn't really remember it. I just wanted it to be better, but then when I got to it, it was like, oh, this is obviously not good. Um, so. Like you guys said, big lineup change here. Lindsay was already out. Now Stevie's out. They replaced Stevie with uh, Becca Bramlett. She's the daughter of uh, Delaney Bramlett. Um, you also got Dave Mason turning up on here, turning in a couple tracks. Like I said, I did see this lineup live. My dad, I believe, got tickets like last minute from someone he works with. We were at my grandparents, and all of a sudden he was like, get in the car, we're driving out to to star lake at a, like a moment's notice we got there kind of late we might have even gotten gotten there like a little bit into their set and they were playing first of three bands which tells you you know fleetwood mac going on before pat benatar and before ario speedwagon kind of tells you where they were in the 90s and what what kind of their uh how far their star had fallen I remember only two things really about the entire show. One is that there were two chicks fist fighting in the lawn right near us. The other thing that I remember is Mick Fleetwood's drum solo, which wasn't even really a drum solo. He had a, a like uh, triggers all through his suit and he was like smacking himself at the front of the stage, like dancing, doing this like weird rhythmic tribal drum solo dance, uh, which was really bizarre. But like Cram said, Becca and Billy Burnett so vanilla it really comes across this whole record sounds like soulless contemporary Christian rock it is really really lame the Dave Mason songs are slightly better but not much and there's only two of them so if they had to put out a record they should have just put out like a, an EP with Christine McVie's tracks which aren't the best Christine McVie songs either by any stretch, but at least her vocals have some kind of character to them. 
Um, but I'm going one and a half on that one. 16, I'm going same as Cram, Behind the Mask from 1990. I think the production on this record is even lamer sounding than on time. Billy Burnett and uh, Rick Vito on guitar do not make up for Lindsey Buckingham. You could probably hire like 10 of those guys and it still wouldn't equal uh, Lindsey Buckingham. They're just not even close. Uh, don't have any idea how those guys were the guys that got offered the job. Like really no one else wants to be in Fleetwood Mac that can do better than this. Uh, it's unbelievable. The reason it's ahead of time is that you at least still have Stevie Nicks and her voice on this record. And, you know, that's something at least. Still, this record's got a lot of problems. The dramatic intro build up on In the Back of My Mind is so lame, really terrible. Billy Burnett's voice is annoyingly plain. It's so plain that it's like, just the worst there's like levels of talent you know and if this guy was like playing at your local bar you'd be like oh he's really talented but he's not Fleetwood Mac talented not even close uh Rolling Stone gave Behind the Mask four out of five stars and said it was one of their best records ever that's insane one and a half stars for me 15 and 14 is where we differ a little bit my 15 is the debut record Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac could be slightly controversial i suppose it's british blues rock more blues than rock for sure it's kind of in the vein of like john mayall and early yardbird stuff you've got bob brunning playing bass on one track he was their original bass player before john mcvee it's a decent blues record uh i just don't find it very compelling or interesting i think if, if you're really into the blues you're better served either going to the source of like the artists they're covering, like Robert Johnson and Elmore James, or going to the more electrified, more intense British version of bands that come a year later in like Led Zeppelin. This is kind of in the middle. I don't know what use it really has. And I don't know, for all the talk of how great of a guitarist Peter Green is, I just really don't hear it that much. He's good. He's fine. But honestly, I think Jeremy Spencer's slide playing on this record is more impressive than anything Peter Green does. It's fine. It's an okay record. I'm skipping two stars, going to two and a half for this one. And my number 14 is their second record, Mr. Wonderful. It's the same lineup, but they add horns and Christine McVie is, or at the time was Christine Perfect. She's playing keys on the record. You're right, musically, not that interesting, not doing much different than the first record. You got the four tracks that have the exact same intro in the same key at the same tempo. It's crazy that they did that. Um, I think two of them are even back-to-back -back songs, but I think the sonic texture of the horns and the keys add a lot, make it a little more interesting to listen to. Um, so that's why I'm giving Mr. Wonderful the edge okay um 13 12 and 11 we're not too far off in fact we're really on for this review my number 13 is peter green's fleetwood mac and i know this is a you know real gem for a lot of people but if you want my review of it rewind three minutes because it's the same as jason's it's decent blues rock but it's too stuck between turning it up and being the Roots soulful originals. It's just kind of lost in between. It's not as wild and fun and loose as I think they think it is when they play. There, and there's no real highlight for me. Uh, uh, Peter Green, one of the better blues guitarists ever. No, not in my book, sorry. Um, nothing is really brought to life. The only highlight I have marked on here is the harmonica on long gray mare like that's that's the only note i really made but it's fine like i don't dislike listening to it but it just doesn't doesn't do much for me so two and a half stars number 13 peter green's fleetwood mac and i'm gonna get in joe's wheelhouse a little bit here next with kiln house at number 12 but i've got it at three stars i think it's a good record so we only have good records from here on so 12 good records for a band is pretty good maybe Fleetwood Mac will make my top 100 artists Station Man is cool the opener bringing on more country rock vibes ba 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 country rock vibes that's why Jason doesn't agree with us getting vibes of the band for sure with like blood on the floor to me the album doesn't really pick up or get interesting or do Fleetwood Mac-y kind of stuff until um Hi Ho Silver 
I like Spencer as a singer. He's got kind of like a John Lennon thing. Buddy's song is pretty good. Sound of the band is fuller, richer, cleaner right now. One Together is a lovely little like prairie country rocker. Love the big drum that com comes in on it. And then great hard rock riffing on Tell Me All the Things You Do actually kind of reminded me of UFO a little bit. So I think it's a good album. 12 good albums for Fleetwood Mac. One of them is also number 11. I've got it three stars. Heroes are hard to find, which I wanted to rate higher and give a better score to. But it's just so all over the place. Like it just it is just a roller coaster of an album. The very big contrast in the first two tracks. The first one's upbeat, funky, kind of R&B. Then you get this beautiful piano and more whirlwind like prog instrumental thing. It's an album that just really is hard to listen to all the way through and know how you feel about it. If you're a musician or you like prog and, you know, just interesting concepts and twists and turns in your compositions, then you're going to like this album, which I do. And I think it's a good album and it's enjoyable. But for me, I love to take a more, you know, emotional and artistic approach to albums. And this one just doesn't really leave me with much to feel other than just being impressed and satisfied and liking the playing. Um, Christy is kind of active on this album, which is nice. She sounds great on Prove Your Love. The album's just a little bit too fragmented for me to really like. I like it. I think it's good. Number 11, three stars. Heroes are hard to find. Okay, we pretty much everything except one. It's going to be the same as Cramser by the time we get down to the top 10. My number 13 is going to be the hated, apparently, Behind the Mask. Pretty sure Rolling Stone paid for that review, or Fleetwood Mac paid Rolling Stone for that review, or Rolling Stone paid Fleetwood Mac with that review to get them on their cover or something, because I was trying to read it after Jason said that, and it is just absolutely insane that they would say that about a band that just lost Lindsey Buckingham. Um, yeah. But that being said, I kind of like the album a little bit, probably more than I should. I think Stevie Nicks's and Christine McVie's contributions are pretty good. I was actually surprised at how much I liked them. I didn't think Nicks had much left after Tango of the Night. I think her stuff on there is pretty weak. Vito and uh, Burnett, though, are, are pretty weak as far as like singers goes and guitarists. It's just so kind of plain average 90s kind of rockers and that that kind of kills it if they were off the album they just did Nick's and McVie stuff I think it'd be pretty good because I do like some of their songs Sky's the Limit, uh, Affairs of the Heart, Behind the Mask all pretty decent I think production's bad though again that like super it, it sounds like someone like emulating a guitar or emulating a, a keyboard. Nothing sounds real at all. So it does suffer from that 90s production. I'm glad we all found Vito and Burnett to be rather plain because I believe in that Rolling Stone review, they said them coming on was the best thing <laughs> to ever happened to Fleetwood Mac. And given you've got like 13 other members in the group, to say that is like the most preposterous thing I've ever heard the best thing that's ever happened to Fleetwood Mac? What the hell? It was, there was definitely some payola involved in that. There, there had to be. There's no way you could actually think that and have your editors be like, yeah, we'll sign off on that. Sure. Um, my number 12, however, is going to be the original Fleetwood Mac, Peter Green Presents or, or whatever. Fleetwood Mac from 68. I like it more than you guys. I think it's three and a half stars. I think it is very good blues, you know, British blues, guitar, rock. I think Jeremy Spencer, though, is clearly the draw here, not Peter Green sort of. I mean, it's fine, but, it, you know, Clapton existed. It's, it's not like he's setting anything new or raising the bar for British blues rock. I think Jeremy Spencer's slide guitar work is much more interesting. Uh, I think the, the rhythm section is already pretty solid uh, between Fleetwood on drums and McVie and whoever that other guy was who played a, a track or two. And I, I do like Spencer and Green's voices. Uh, they have like a kind of solid British guy singing the blues. 
they're warm. They don't take it too seriously, I think. And um, some some good covers here, I think, of of classic uh, blues songs like uh, "How Hound on My Trail" and "Shake Your Money Maker" are both pretty good. So three and a half for that. My number eleven. Uh, I'm gonna jump up to the Bob Welch, Christine McVie era, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Penguin for my number eleven. Just missing the top ten. Still at three and a half stars. I think on this one, you really start to notice how good the production starts to sound. This is 73. The instruments are, are really cleaner and clearer, and you really get that 70s production on here. Welch is an, an interesting choice for Fleetwood Mac. Like he, he's almost doing like this yacht rock stuff sometimes, a little R&B on Bright Fire. Uh, Revelation has some nice Latin-flavored rock to it. And a rare but uh, essential bass solo from McVie on that. I think it's a pretty good album, but I'm missing some of Danny Kerwin's guitar on this a little bit. It, it, Welch is just not quite as interesting, um, but there's some good stuff. Uh, Did You Ever Love Me has some cool steel drums. And it is like, it's sunny, it's a little tropical, it's, it's brighter and, and more upbeat, I think, than any of their other records. So. I liked it, but uh, I don't know. It comes in like an awkward period between like the Danny Kerwin stuff and the the Lindsey Buckingham stuff. So the, the guitar work of that era just lets me down a little bit. Uh, but I, I think Christine McVie's songs, this might be her best era between Buckingham and Kerwin where she kind of gets the shine. So it's a good album, but uh, not, not the best of Fleetwood Mac. Uh, I had the uh, agreed upon terrible records of time and behind the mask at the very bottom. And I'm going to just uh, from there continue blasting through the Peter Green era. My number 13 is then play on, uh, which I know is going to be a controversial call. Um, it's more stylistically varied than the first two. That's for sure. It's generally considered the masterpiece of the Peter Green era clearly a step up from those first two. Martin Birch was the engineer on this record. And there's a bunch of different track listings for this. There's like a whole bunch of different versions of it that were released in the UK. I think there's like four UK versions, the US version. I was going with the original for my ranking here, which omits uh, probably the most well-known song from the era, which is Oh Well, sizable hit, I guess, for them. And uh, a hit again, later in the 70s when the Rockets covered it. So Jeremy Spencer leaves the group at this point. He goes off and records a solo record, which is backed entirely by Fleetwood Mac. Um, So I don't really know why it's not a Fleetwood Mac record, but uh, you get Danny Kerwin here instead. I think the Kerwin tracks are really cool. He does like kind of this lilting pastoral folk type of songwriting, which I love. I love his melodic sensibility. Um, He brings all these kind of like psychedelic touches and also like kind of an air of sadness to a lot of his material, which I think is really cool. But I think it's kind of an odd pairing uh, up against Green's electric blues. Uh, Even when Kerwin turns in a blues song like Without You, it has like this melancholy to it. And I don't don't think the two of them, uh, Green and Kerwin, ever really jive on this record that well. I don't know. I know people love this record. People... You know, people that are, aren't as into the Buckingham Knicks era will often cite this as the best Fleetwood Mac record. Uh, I just not really hearing it, not super into it. I'm at two and a half stars. I think it's just okay. My number 12 is Say You Will. This is, you know, almost the classic lineup. They reunited to do the dance and then Christine McVie left the band, uh, citing her fear of flying. Don't underestimate Christine McVie. She is great. And her absence on this record is definitely felt. I think ultimately because of her absence, um, Buckingham and Nix are leaned a little too hard on. Um, You know, it requires them to write more material themselves. The record is way, way too long. The record's longer than Tusk. It's an hour and 16 minutes. Um, You could easily shave a half an hour off of it with no problem at all. One positive thing I'll say about the record, even though their voices are aging significantly, I do think they do a good job of kind of adapting to their changing voices. And I think 
you know, they write material that works for their voices. And, and I think they sound pretty good on it, especially Lindsay, who has kind of like a, an almost entirely new voice uh, compared to the rumor days and uh, still sounds good. There are good tracks. I think Thrown Down is good. Red Rover, Say You Will, Peacekeeper, Bleed to Love Her are all good songs. Um, just there's way too much other stuff that isn't of the same caliber. I think if you take those good songs, maybe another track or two of theirs uh, that are pretty good. And then if you had like three or four really great Christine McVie songs, that would be a really, really good reunion record. Uh, instead, you've got a lot of subpar material just weighing the thing down. It's almost like a, a really satisfying return to form, but not quite. And, you know, I think it's still a much better note to go out on than time. So at least there's that uh, three stars for that one. And then just missing my top 10 is Tango in the Night from 1987. This one started out when they were making it as a Buckingham solo record, and then the other members kind of got involved and it morphed into a full Fleetwood Mac record. Stevie Nicks was like full on into her solo career at the time, uh, and she only spent two weeks out of the 18 months that they worked on the record actually recording with the band. So she's kind of an afterthought. I think the hits on this record are great. And it opens really strong with Big Love, Seven Wonders, and Everywhere. I mean, what a killer trifecta to open a record with. You also have Little Lies, which is great. And on the back of those singles, it became their second biggest selling record next to Rumors. Production-wise, though, it's got the really kind of late 80s sheen on it, which I think helps those singles. It really makes the singles sparkle and kind of pop and it's really great. Unfortunately, over the course of the entire record, it just doesn't really work that well. It starts to feel a little superficial. It's like having too much sugar. It, it just, it, it wears on you after a while. Uh, and also I think the non-singles, I mean, there were six singles from this record. So the other half of the record, I think is a pretty big step down. I, I don't think those songs work nearly as well. So for me, this record really just about the singles. I think it's got six really strong hits on it and six very mediocre to poor songs, especially Mystified, uh, which is a Christine McVie tune. That one just crawls along at a snail's pace, but the singles make it decent. It's a three-star record. Top 10 time. I'm going to kick it off with a three-star album named Penguin. Um, kind of agree with Joe. They're picking up where they left off with the album previous. Uh, but it's not quite as good. When I think Fleetwood Mac, I think Rumors. So kind of a lot of my reviews from now on of these albums are going to be comparing to Rumors. I like that lineup and that sound. And you can si kind of hear, like Joe was saying, especially with the production, kind of get the seeds of that. Um, and proving it's not just, you know, Stevie and Lindsay and Christy writing these big pop rock hits. But I don't think John McVie and... Um, McFleet would get enough credit for kind of holding down the band through all these years in the rhythm section, especially in Dissatisfied, which has like that joyous band feel of like, don't stop. Um, but this just doesn't do quite as much for me as like Bare Trees does. The songs just aren't quite as captivating. A song like Roadrunner is cool, but it never really takes off and fires on all cylinders. Like everything's just kind of has a bit of a wet blanket over it. And I think just one of the re reasons why like an album like this just kind of misses some of my favorite Fleetwood Mac stuff is it doesn't have the emotional content that they can work with when they get all those X crossed lovers going. Um, Derelict is a bit plain for me vocally, but Revelation is awesome. I love the percussion and the guitar. There are some interesting things in here and choices that I don't really know how to process or how I feel about like the steel drums and did you ever love me? It's so random and I just don't know how I feel about it. It's just really weird. Nightwatch is absolutely sensational. Guitar work is phenomenal. It is a cool selection to bring in Welch, but his style is just awesome. And the Clarence White thing that I mentioned earlier in the video, for people that don't know, um, go watch our video of The Birds, um, both the album ranking and our side three. Caught in the Rain is beautiful. Penguin, good album, three stars, my number 10. My number 10, I'm going to go with a horrifying album cover. <laughs> Could be multiple things still. I don't know what the hell they were thinking in like the 70s with some of these album covers. 
This is probably their worst. I got Heroes Are Hard to Find. And they, it could be another one because there's a couple of them. But just the album cover alone made me not listen to this album for my entire life. I, I've seen this, you know, scrolling through Fleetwood Mac. I, I love Fleetwood. You'd think I'd be like, oh, I'll dial into their discography. I see this cover and they covered a mystery to me. And I'm like, nah, good. Uh, which is unfortunate because I think pretty good album. I have it at three and a half stars. Really the star here. And I guess we have a Clarence White situation with Bob Welch for, for Kramser. I think Bob Welch is fine, but I don't, you know, not a revelation to me. I, I wasn't not in love with his style. I think Christine McVie is the hero of these kind of mid 70s Fleetwood Mac albums before Lindsey Buckingham comes around. Uh, all her songs are really good. I, I think this might be maybe her best overall work on any album. She's really just carrying the band here. Some of Welch's stuff, Bermuda Triangle, I don't know, a little kind of jokey. It doesn't quite work for me. Uh, but I do like Silver Heels a lot. Uh, name checking Paul McCartney and Etta James in one song is, is kind of interesting. And, you know, it's just some really good pop rock, a little bit of, um, a little bit of like yacht rock, a little bit light FM, a little Eaglesy sometimes even. Um, but I think it's very good and come a little bit closer. I just love. And of course, Sneaky Pete Klein Al is on that one. So that makes sense. His pedal steel work, always immaculate. And uh, I think it goes perfectly with McVie's kind of upbeat piano. And she, ha she has such a cool voice. Like it's very adult and mature sounding. It's kind of the opposite of, of like a Stevie Nicks or some of these other 70s female singers. Like it, it, it sounds like she's like 45, 50 years old. And it's never like kind of precious like Stevie Nicks sometimes can get. Like it's very just sort of like straightforward, just like, no BS. And I, I really do like that. I, I think she kind of has been my revelation going back and listening through all these albums. So this one's, it's, it's a four star album. I'll, I'll give it four stars. We'll start off the top 10 with four stars because it is, it is an interesting album, even if I'm not in love with, with Bob Welch as much as you guys seem to be. All right, my number 10 is going to be 1982's Mirage far more straightforward than its predecessor, Tusk, more soft rock, more pop, a little bit of a disappointing direction. I think the songs are still pretty decent. All three vocalists are still in top form. It just feels really half-hearted and a little bit defeated. Like maybe Tusk didn't perform quite as well as they had hoped. Now they are embarking on solo careers and doing well. And there's just kind of this feeling of like, do we even really want to be in Fleetwood Mac anymore? Uh, and that kind of runs through the record. I think it's an okay record. Like I said, good pop songs. Gypsy's really great. Uh, Buckingham's Book of Love is really cool. Love in Store's a cool tune. It's a fine pop album. Uh, not bad, but, you know, Rumors still only five years ago. And, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like they're one of Rock's premier acts anymore at this point. It feels like you know, they've gone from like the biggest band in the world down to like hanging on by a thread at this point. So not bad, not great. Three stars. Well, I disagree with Jason about Mirage. I thought it was good. We'll talk about it later. My number nine, I've got Fleetwood Mac from 1975 or the White Album. I've got it at three stars. I think it's good. Literally a precursor for rumors comes right before it in every sense. And it's kind of Setting the stage, getting ready for rumors to explode. Can't be surprising we're mentioning rumors in every single review here. Monday Morning is a great opener and introduces you to the newest band member and that infectious Fleetwood Mac feel-good pop kind of uh, thing they do, arguably better than anyone. You get the smooth, silky sensations of Christy on Warm Ways with some really nice slide guitar playing, super rich and buttery, just spreading over that song like Toast. Blue Letter, we're getting a little something more upbeat, a little more rocking, getting that awesome Lindsay rhythm. You know, the, the three of them, Lindsay, Chrissy, and Stevie, are also wholesome and powerful at the same time, but all have such different 
voices literally, the sounds of their sonic voice, and just what they have to offer stylistically and artistically. Rhiannon comes in and introduces you to Stevie in that classic bewitching kind of way. Great way for her to make her print on the band. Over My Head is a sweet, good 70s groove. Love the soft electric piano. And I really relate to um, you know, Over My Head and Over My Head, but it sure feels nice. Crystal was quite nice. Love that little synthy, spacey loop that comes in. Say You Love Me is a great kickoff for side two. And then it kind of goes downhill a little bit for me. I've never liked Landslide. It's like the hole in my... Um, classic Fleetwood Mac song that and don't stop I actually don't care for much either world turning is sweet um Lindsay you know that acoustic guitar licking that he does so well but then it closes quite poorly for me with sugar daddy and I'm so afraid so very close to three and a half stars but just three there's something missing there's a missing ingredient here perhaps it's all of the you know they're not really x's yet or anything so too happy, too much good stuff. We need some drama and it will come, but it is a good album with good songs, just not quite really good or great for me. Number nine, Fleetwood Mac, 1975, The White Album. Well, I have to say, this is the most horrified I think I've ever been. I cannot believe we have a Mirage and a self-titled already. This is blowing my mind. I had no idea people thought this way. Um, okay, well, that, that's, those are both wrong. You're both terribly wrong on all of these so far. My number nine is going to be Then Play On from 69. You got Danny Kerwin coming in and Spencer going out. And it's a real weird juxtaposition between what he does with the folky, real folky guitar driven songs. They're very slow and like methodical. And it's, just a really weird change from them to do that and to have like Peter Green invite like a new guitarist that just completely changes the sound of the band in every way. And I guess that's kind of what Peter Green did. Like he didn't want to be the dude in the spotlight. So he kept inviting like these other kind of great guitarists into the band. So he invites in Danny Kerwin, who's just awesome. I really like all the stuff he does. Uh, very interesting, almost singer songwriter at, at sometimes. And he has like an old timey vibrato that he busts out on, on When You Say. Like it doesn't sound like a blues song or a, a regular folk song. It sounds like he's trying to emulate somebody from like I don't know, the 50s or, or something. It's really cool and, and weird sounding. And I don't even know if it really works for what Fleetwood Mac is doing or what they're trying to do. But it's so kind of out there and different and unique. You know, I, I just really liked it. You have something like Showbiz Blues, which is very bluesy, but with like that light folky touch. Definitely reminds me of like Zeppelin III. Uh, but this was before Zeppelin III, so it kind of presages that, which is, is cool. Uh, One Sunny Day, kind of more typical Peter Green, heavier blues stuff. Really like the drum pattern from Mick on that. And you even have like a little Baroque pop almost on Although the Sun is Shining. And it's just a really kind of cool sounding record. I did not, I really haven't paid attention at all to these, you know, previous albums before the glory days of Buckingham and Nick. So this one kind of just took me by surprise as soon as I heard it. I didn't realize they had someone like Kerwin in the band. So I definitely enjoyed that um, in a, just an, an interesting album. It's not something that I don't think they would replicate again. It's not something that really anyone was doing at the time. So I enjoyed it a lot. I have it at four stars for them play on. All right. My number nine is Penguin from 1973. This time Martin Birch is producing. Uh, you get Welch, Weston, McVie, McFleetwood, Dave Walker, the only record that he is on. It's a cool record, but a little bit perplexing. Uh, on one hand, Christine McVie's tracks, really great. She's really coming into her own, I think, as a pop songwriter. Uh, really kind of 
you know, paving the way for the Buckingham Knicks years. I think production wise, they're kind of inching in that direction as well by this point. But Dave Walker comes in, he does two tracks right in the middle of the record. If you're on the vinyl, he's got the last song on side one, the first song on side two. He does I'm a Roadrunner and The Derelict. These two tracks seem to be working in the total opposite direction of the like more pop leaning stuff that Christine McVie is doing. I have no idea why they invited him into the band. It makes no sense. And his voice isn't really anything either here. He doesn't sound very good on this record. Then you got Bob Welch doing his own thing, basically sounding like Bob Welch solo tracks. You've got uh, Peter Green guesting on a track. You've also have an instrumental uh, from Bob Weston, the other guitarist near the end of the record. Everything is pulling in different directions on this. I don't know. I, I really like some of the songs. Some of the Bob Welch tunes are really cool. Some of the Christine McVie songs are really, really nice. Uh, but as a full album listen, it just doesn't work too well for me. And I think it was Joe in his review said uh, that Welch wasn't a good uh, replacement for Kerwin. But I, I think Welch and Kerwin together were amazing. So I think the problem isn't Welch here, but it's Weston and uh, Dave Walker not being a good replacement for Kerwin. These couple records right after Kerwin leaves, Welch seems to be like trying to find a connection with another guitarist and just not quite jiving with anyone. So yeah, cool stuff, but not a cool full record. Uh, three stars. For me, number eight is going to be Future Games, three stars. It's kind of the first with Christy McPhee being a full major player here. Uh, I love the sound of the opener, Woman of a Thousand Years. Great song, cool, like ghostly Americana vibe, almost like the band America. Uh, but is right now, as part of their timeline, considerably better produced, engineered, and mixed than any album to date. Sounds great, especially for its time. What a shame is okay. So far, three songs in, like I'm getting shoved around a lot with tone and style. And then Future Games title track is really good. Sands of Time is cool. Really dig the guitar tones on this album. Sometimes is a really good song. Fantastic lead guitar. Lead guitar is great all over the place. It is a good album with great moments, but lacks some unity and flavor in the songwriting prowess that they'll eventually get. So... Just three stars, still good. Number eight, Future Games. Three stars still. It's, it's really low for a band like this. I'm, I'm shocked. It's good. No, no it's not. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's not a, a classic band like Fleetwood Mac. If you give them three stars. F is Future Games the first album you think of when you think of Fleetwood Mac? No, but it's a great album. My number eight is going to be Bear Trees. I have it four stars, like most of these. These are all really good albums. Uh, Danny Kerwin's guitar, awesome right off the bat on Child of Mine. You have uh, Christine McVie really becoming a very good pop songwriter. Homeward Bound um, works really well. And I think she meshes with, or maybe Kerwin meshes with her better, I think, than she does with Welch. Because his, his guitar edition's uh, really great uh, on her tracks. You have Sunny Side of Heaven, which might be the prettiest song on the whole album. It's a shame it's an instrumental, because it sounds like it could have been a hit single if they threw a couple lyrics on there. Uh, you got Sentimental Lady, which is another kind of sunshiny pop song for an album title called Bear Trees. It's pretty upbeat a lot of the time. Uh, really great double stop guitar solo. Uh, it's very sunny, very California, but it's not like hokey. It's not like a Seals and Cross kind of sound. And I think a lot of that has to do with how good Kerwin is at guitar, his leads. And I agree with what Jason was saying. Welch and Kerwin definitely work better together, I think, than anyone else. And it seems like they bring in McVie stuff better as well. Like it seems like there's this weird kind of total difference between Welch and McVie, but when Kerwin, McVie, and Welch are together, it all kind of works together for me even better. Spare me a little of your love from Christine McVie with that really great kind of buoyant piano that she brings in, uh, and his upbeat vocals. 
I think that that song, maybe her first, like, really, I don't know how to say it, but it's really the first one that she put together that sounds like it could have landed on Mirage or Rumors or something like that. Like, it feels very, like, later on for her. So I think she's already become a pretty darn good pop songwriter and um, closes, well, it closes with that weird Thoughts on a Gray Day, which is that talking, that old lady talking, which kind of kills it for me. Uh, but track before that, Dust, really great guitar tones on that from Kerwin and Welch on the acoustic and the lead. The, the vocals have this kind of contemporary, almost indie folk quality to them, which I found very cool. So yeah, I, another one that I didn't know existed before this, but uh, I think is very, very good. So four stars for Bear Trees for me. All right, my number eight is Heroes Are Hard to Find. They're just a four piece on this, just two songwriters. You got seven Bob Welch tracks here, four from Christine McVie. This is the last record before Buckingham next join. And it was their highest charting to date, made it to number 34 on the Billboard charts. Um, so they weren't entirely without any success before Buckingham and Nicks came along. I like McVie and Welch, and I think they're both doing great work. But the thing that holds this era back a little, and I think Joe kind of hit on this as well, is that, that it feels like two different bands. You have a track like uh, Come a Little Bit Closer, which is so lush with strings. You got pedal steel and all these harmonies layered. It's really an amazing track, but it feels like Christine McVie is already in the Fleetwood Mac of the future with uh, Buckingham Knicks and, and transitioning between those tracks back to what Welch is doing, which is really cool. And I like his songs. He's got like this jazzy, mystical, I don't know. He's got a really unique style. It's hard to, hard to describe, um, but, but really cool. The, just going back and forth between those two sounds is so jarring and, and it doesn't really work. But I agree that when Curran was in the band and it was the three of them back on uh, Future Games and on Bare Trees, it felt much more like uh, a, they had a synergy going on. But like I said, Welch tunes are cool. I really like the, the country vibes on uh, She's Changing Me and Silver Heels. Coming Home and Angel are both great tracks as well. And of course, you know, like I said, the brilliant uh, come a little bit closer. That song is fantastic. I think it all adds up to a to a good record, um, but a little disjointed. But I am bumping up now to three and a half stars. All right, we're on number seven now. And I'm up to three and a half stars, which for my scale is really good. I've got Tango in the Night. Big 80s production finally meets Fleetwood Mac in full swing. Jason was right. Those three songs to open with um, Big Love, Seven Wonders, Everywhere, all really good. I dig the vibe on this album. It's like a little bit darker and more risque, more like sexually deviant in like a really lame way, but it works. It's like really melodramatic and like winds blowing through the curtains and everything. It's like bombastic in that way, but it, it's really cool. I think the title track is really good. I love the guitar work on it. Family Man, Lindsay's doing this really cool, like Spanish style plucking. It's really nice. Isn't It Midnight is cool and has like mystical twinkling 80s mystique. I think the songwriting is all kind of in this cool pop realm. Um, I don't think the, I agree with Jason that the hits are the best part, but I don't think the other tracks that support it are nearly as bad as he does. My least favorite song on it is You and I Part Two. But I do think just the vibe, really good. They're really good songwriters. Everyone's voice is cool. And just having, you know, that Fleetwood Mac dynamic with all three of them kind of putting in their part and it kind of gels for some reason. You can't really put your finger on. I think it's here. I think it works. Um, so, yeah, I'm going with a really good 3.5, Tango in the Night, number seven. Also my number seven, but I think I'm closer to Jason than Cramser as far as it's basically just the singles for me that carry this. Big Love, Seven Wonders, Everywhere, Tango in the Night, Family Man, Little Lies. Other than that, I think it's eh, mediocre. Stevie Nicks doesn't do much here. She's on Seven Wonders, Welcome to the Room, dot, 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 Sarah. 
and when I see you again, probably her weakest output of any of the albums she's on to this point. And same for Christine McVie, really Little Lies is probably the only one on here that's like essential Christine McVie. I think she actually kind of takes a step down as far as the era of Fleetwood Mac where with Buckingham mix, it seems like McVie's contributions are pretty hit or miss for me. This one, Little Eyes is great, but nothing else is, is really up to par. And Lindsey Buckingham's kind of piecing it all together. He's still the man pretty much running the show. Like Jason said, it was kind of a uh, Buckingham solo album at first. Everyone else got involved. So, it, I mean, it's mostly his show, but the guitar work, not nearly as interesting as it is on Mirage or Rumors or Tusk. And it, it kind of feels held together with, with tape on this. Uh, I do like sort of the, I think Crams are nailed it, the, the wind through the curtains. It's like a soap opera set kind of like feel to the whole thing. It, it's almost like tacky and, and fake, but I think on Big Love with the, the back and forth like sex voices at, uh, at the end there when they're like speeding up like that, that kind of sets the mood for the whole album really well. So uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good listen. It's four stars, but it's mostly on, on the back of those singles that are you know, really good. You can hear them on the radio daily if, you, if you'd like. So that, that's, that's what brings it to four. As far as like a whole album experience, eh, it's got great singles. All right. Hold on to your butt, Joe. My number seven is Tusk. I don't know. So they're suddenly the biggest band in the world and they decide to get all weird and experimental with this one. It's a double album, 20 tracks, still shorter than Say You Will. And to me, a lot of that decision doesn't serve the music that well. I mean, you can't suddenly become talking heads while Christine McVie and Stevie Nicks are bringing you these like beautiful singer songwriter Fleetwood Mac tunes. So I think a lot of this record kind of has the problem that that pre Buckingham Nicks Fleetwood Mac was having on records like Penguin and Heroes Are Hard to Find where you everyone feels like they're pulling in different directions. Lindsay's trying to get really weird and experimental. I also don't think the, the material coming from Nix and McVie is really anywhere close to the standard they had set with the previous two records. I've always been kind of shocked that uh, Sarah was such a big hit for them. I think that is one of the most hookless songs that Stevie Nicks ever wrote. I just don't understand how that was a hit. I don't know. There, there's good stuff on here. I think a lot of the experimentation that uh, Lindsey Buckingham does works pretty well for his songs. I think the ledge is really, really weird and really, really cool. I think it works great. But also there's like pacing problems with the record over and over, opening the record really slow and then going into the ledge is so awkward and weird way to start the record. I don't know. I, I, I like it. I, I like a lot of it. It just the idea that this record somehow compares to rumors or that there's people that think this is better than rumors, maybe amongst us, uh, just is absolutely absurd to me. I mean, Rumors is a record where almost every track is a 10 out of 10. And I don't think there's one 10 out of 10 out of the 20 songs here. So not even remotely in the same league as Rumors. There's cool stuff on it. It's interesting, but I can only go three and a half for it. Well, I'm not going to talk about Tusk quite yet, but I do think it is um, like the idea of putting it, letting it compete with Rumors is just crazy they i have them one and a half stars apart which is a pretty big gap they, it is but let's talk about my next one which is going to be number six mystery to me i like it a lot i like emerald eyes i don't mind hypnotized at all i think it's pretty cool i think welch has great guitar work on it um it's a really smooth record with him kind of taking the reins this is probably the one where his stamp is on the most and Jason's right. His guitar playing is so cool and stylish. He has great feel, but his style was somewhere in between like brooding and dark and jazzy. 
and like full of texture. It would have been really cool to hear what he could have done with some other artists, like playing on like, you know, not to sacrilege and say anything needs something different. That's already awesome. Like if he was playing on something like Melt by Peter Gabriel or like some really artistic stylistic kind of, you know, pop art albums, I think, I think he just is someone that I wish was all over the rest of the history of music and pop rock, but not too much song on here that does not do it for me is forever. I don't like it at all really until it picks up and that guitar part comes in and I love it after that. But it's one of those songs that we've talked about a lot recently, like uh, Jason with um, uh, that Faith No More hit where he hates the verse and loves the chorus. That's kind of how I feel. I'm so vexed in between here. The City is awesome. Great groove and tons of attitude. Miles Away is good. For Your Love is kind of a cool cover. But, you know, I think Christy sounds great here. But for me, it's all about Welch and just it's an album that I'm just listening to the guitar every second and being encapsulated for him. It's probably a three star album, but with his guitar work on it, I've got it at 3.5 and really like it and it could grow. So mystery to me, number six, three and a half stars. I'm still rolling through the four star albums. My number six, future games from 71, Kerwin, Bob Welch on rhythm, McVee, McVee, Fleetwood, on the drums and this is another one this is i think i started with this one when i went back and started this discography i didn't start with the the real early peter green blues stuff i wanted something a little little lusher so i decided on future games glad i did uh really like danny kerwin's lead work on this one on the title track future games uh, which was written by Welch, but Kerwin's leads, he's doing like this Jimi Hendrix, Carlos Santana thing, where he's really working like the low uh, low end of the guitar. It sounds amazing. That really kind of blew my mind the first time I heard it. Just like the percussive nature of the way he's playing. Really cool. And then you juxtapose that with a song like Morning Rain and the closer Show Me a Smile by Christine McVie. It's like really nice 70s, pretty pop songs. And it's just, a, it's a weird mix. It really is. But somehow it all works when McVie, Welch, and Kerwin are together. Uh, Sands of Time, another like real kind of lead guitar oriented focus track. And there's a, a little bit of like R&B and a little bit of 70s, like Eagles kind of rock on here. I guess it was before the Eagles. So that LA kind of sound. But it's just not a, an album that, you, I, I, at least for me, I had never heard anything quite like this combination of different elements. So it was really cool to hear this. Um, I think the, the bass and the drum, we haven't talked about that enough. And I definitely will later on some of the Buckingham Knicks albums, but the, the drum and the bass work, is really good, basically starting from the beginning. But I think on this album, especially, you really start to notice how good Cleewood is with the different from rhythms and patterns and sounds that he's laying down. So got to give some shout outs to him. And I think, you know, McVee's already a pretty good songwriter. So she kind of comes in. She was in Chicken Check before this. So she comes in kind of fully formed. There's not any awkward growth period. So it's a, it's a weird mix of, of these different sounds, but uh, very unique and real cool. So I got a four stars for future games. My number six is the same as Cram's number six. I have Mystery to Me, produced by Fleetwood Mac and Martin Birch. Got the five-piece lineup here with Welch and Weston on guitar. Welch and McVie work well here. They're still very different songwriters. Uh, but I think the production is more uniform between their tracks on this record. You have a track like Just Crazy Love, which I think is a great song. Uh, but unlike some of the other Christine McVie tracks on records like Penguin and Heroes Are Hard to Find, it feels like a lot more influence came from other band members. You've got all this really cool guitar work from Welch and Weston going on in this track, um, which you don't always really hear on the Christine McVie tracks on other records. And I think it works really, really well. Hypnotize. I think totally rolls such a cool tune. Keep on going 
is another example of kind of cross pollination between the members on this, which uh, is a song written by Welch, but that Christine McVie sings. So I, I think things like that, you know, the extra guitars on a Christine McVie track or uh, singing each other's songs, I think lends it to feeling, you know, you have more of that ba band dynamic happening on this record instead of feeling like every songwriter is just using uh Mick Fleetwood and John McVie is a backing band and you have like three different EPs on the record. So I think that puts this ahead of some of the other records of this era. The one thing here that really doesn't work too well for me is the Weston, John McVie and Bob Welch uh, co-written tune called Forever, which is kind of like a reggae tune. I don't think it really fits in too well. And, you know, maybe another example of having a few too many cooks in the kitchen. But I think you know, with the record, the, re the rest of the record being so strong, it's kind of easy to forgive a track like Forever. Like on this record, it feels kind of just like a weird kind of aside and it doesn't really detract too, too much from the rest of the record. There's some some really great guitar that I assume is Weston on the rocking uh, Bob Welch tune Miles Away, which I think is really nice. Uh, I think side two of this record is much more guitar heavy. Um, this track somebody has some great guitar interplay between Weston and Welch uh very cool stuff so overall I think it's very good uh four star record all right top five favorite Fleetwood Mac albums I'm not quite at four yet four stars but I will be from a number four the number five is Tusk and half of this album is five stars half of it is not 3.5 is where it comes out to. It was, uh, I don't think anyone's mentioned this yet, the most expensive album ever for its time. Came in at what would now be like three and a half million dollars or something. Same lineup as before, or the album before. Same arrangement, everyone taking turns with their songs. This one, as you guys, Jason said already, is more experimental. It's sparser, looser, less nailed down, weaving kind of in and out of their uh, pop rock structure pop rock structure. I think the album sounds great, especially the low end. The low end sounds so good on this album. Over and Over is really good. I don't know about it as an opener. In fact, I really don't. We did a resequencer for Rumors. Tusk could use it too. I do not like how this album is sequenced whatsoever, especially in the fact that the reason why I can't get this to four stars as a great album is 90% of the songs I really like are on the second half. The second half is so much better than the first half. And there's some good stuff in the first half. The ledge is kind of cool and quirky. You know, I love that style of Lindsay's writing when he's like this real innocent boyish sweetheart. But there is kind of a lot of duds just that kill the momentum and just aren't near the quality of rumors. So like Jason was saying, and I backed him up on, I don't, I'm fine with people like really enjoying Tusk, really thinking it's, you know, great but to me I, I don't it's really not even close to rumors you know sarah is okay what makes you think you're the one is good storms i don't really care for not that funny i don't like sisters of the moon is decent but it kind of sounds like a bunch of other fleetwood mac songs that are better with kind of like the same vibe but then after that i think it's really strong brown eyes never make me cry i know i'm not wrong honey high beautiful child all just five star kind of quality songs for me i think they're great and so i just don't really understand why they would make the albums so long so dense and i also don't think especially with a lot of the songs and even those songs i just mentioned they're still not as good as the one on rumors i think they just overcomplicated this album like they're not playing to their strengths they just got a little pretentious, maybe. Let's be honest. They were like, we're the just had one of the biggest pop rock albums of all time. Let's show everyone else what else we can do. And that's cool, but they took it too far. It doesn't flow well. It's a little clunky. It's a little bit too tricky. And the brilliance of rumors is they write these songs that communicate all of these things so well. And this album does not communicate that much to me at all. It's really cool but it doesn't have the same charm that Rumors does. It's still really good, three and a half stars. If they edited it and rearranged it a little bit, made it shorter, got those back half songs on, it could be a great album. But to me, it's just merely really good. Just so a fun way to live your life to enjoy really good albums. So number five, 3.5 Tusk. 
Now, do you think I've broken down the, the, the issue here? So you guys just way overrate rumors and it's kind of shading everything. Because it, I mean, I've listen, rumors, wonderful, love rumors, but the way you're talking about it compared to the other albums is, I don't know, it's, it's weird to me. I just don't hear it that way. My number five is going to be Mystery to Me. Another really terrible cover on this. Like that probably is what cost them, you know, like becoming famous at this point. Just these covers are ridiculous. Giant like weird gorilla thing in the cake. And I don't know, another album where I like I've seen it. And I was like, I don't want to listen to this album. It, it looks really weird just from the cover. But again, to my detriment, because it's a really good album, four stars. The band seems to be getting poppier, poppier with each release. Uh, the production a little shinier, a little richer, fuller. I think McVie and Welch, they're singing on this and they're playing is a, the, the best it'll ever be. Uh, Emerald Eyes is a really fantastic pop song from Welch. Uh, Believe Me, a uh, little like dreamy, almost psychedelic Latin tinged rocker with some really great guitar work from Welch, uh, but uh, sung by McVie. So I think they're kind of integrating the best that they ever do on this album. I think Jason mentioned that before. This is the album, I think, where they really kind of start to mesh and they actually get away from it a little bit on A Hero's Time to Find. But I think on this one, it works. I don't know if it's because of the extra guitarist or, or what, but this is the, the most cohesive, I think, that this lineup gets. And it, it really works. The 70s kind of production, really great. Each, you know, each guitar sounds, each, you know, the bass sounds, the drum sounds. It's all so clear. You can hear every note. It just all comes together really well. Uh, the, the city, great blue scorcher. Uh, McVie's pop gems, believe me, just crazy love are great. Uh, you got a song that keep on going great drum and bass work. And then you throw in some like dramatic, I got like Buckmeister kind of esque strings on that one. Uh, I even Ooh. think the cover for your love is pretty darn good. And uh, especially the drumming on that track from Fleetwood, really great kind of that like powerful, but like ragged kind of style that he has always very interesting. But I think just as a, as a whole, it's a really good album cohesive. There's no, you know, no songs where they kind of fall flat on their face or like grasping at something they can't quite deliver. Even the the funky Jamaican Island groove forever, probably the weakest track, but I don't, you know, I don't think it's a bad track or anything. So four stars for sure for Mystery to Me from 1973. Just, just almost into the, the glory days of Dix and Buckingham, but this is one of those albums that People probably ignore because it's not Nick's Buckingham, but one that they should check out. All right. My number five is a record that both of you talked about a long time ago, and I'm not entirely surprised. It is a pretty weird record, but I've got Kiln House at number five. And this is a weird like lineup shifting type of thing happening because Kerwin replaced Spencer on Then Play On. And Spencer went and made a solo record with all of the members of Fleetwood Mac. And then Peter Green left. Spencer came back. So this is Spencer and Kerwin. And on uh, Spencer's solo record, he did a lot of this like 50s homage slash parody type of stuff. And he brings a lot of that back to the band with him on Kiln House. You know, you have basically him going for like a, a 50s, 60s Nashville sound on a track like uh, blood on the floor you've got him doing uh buddy holly cover slash reimagining buddy's song is what it's called on the record it, it's basically a cover of uh, peggy sue got married and then he changes the lyrics to a bunch of other buddy buddy holly songs uh, which is pretty cool this is the rock opens the record it's doing kind of like an elvis impersonation almost vocally kerwin on the other hand I think all of his tracks are stand in pretty stark contrast uh, to what Jeremy Spencer's doing. 
he's bringing like more bluesy rock tunes into the fold that somehow the way it's mixed and the way the vocals sit on the record kind of make everything work together pretty well, even though they're doing very different things. Um, so I don't think it's like really, you know, too jarring going from track to track. I think it works. Uh, Jewel eyed Judy, I think is the standout track from Kerwin really cool tracks like that and one together and mission bell, I think kind of signal where the band is heading. And this is definitely a transition record where they're moving away from the early Peter green, blues british blues rock thing but they're not quite to the to the poppy or stuff yet um so i think they're kind of just like figuring out what what's next on this record but i i think you know in doing that and in, in searching it it's kind of a, a charming jaunt through the history of american rock filtered through this like british blues band i don't know it's, it's really cool i like it uh five stars or no sorry four and a half stars <laughs> four and a half stars for killing house Ooh. Ooh. yeah like i said when i was talking about it i can see why jason would be all about it okay number four we got four stars great albums only from now on for me mirage and Actually, kind of a bit of a boring opener for me. I'm not crazy about Love in Store. After that, everything's hunky-dory. So, like, I really like, I do like a, can't go back, get a little bit bigger 80s drum sound here. That's all right. It's a tremendous vessel for Stevie to kind of do her, like Joe said, precious kind of country folk witch kind of deal. I think she sounds great here. Book of Love coming in from Lindsay is terrific. And album might not be as pure and as natural as Rumors, but they're really finding how to do that sweetheart pop rock on this album. Gypsy is great. Christy really shines on Only uh, Over You. Empire State is a song I don't remember hearing on the album, like even though I've listened to it a bunch and I was like, this is so different and so cool. It's got like almost like post-punk or like glam NYC vibes. It doesn't sound like anything else really in their catalog. It's very cool. Um, Straight Back is great. Stevie really has phenomenal command on that song. Hold Me is great. Oh, Diane is decent. I do think that would have been a better closer than Wish You Were Here. I think it. I think the album would serve better if it ended on something a little more cutesy rather than Wish You Were Here, which is like a more emotional, great piano ballad, which is a really good song. But Mirage is sweet, it's sharp, sometimes perky. It's a really good, pretty little effort with really great songs. And, you know, unlike a criticism I had of Tusk, this does to me really play to their strengths. And um, it's a great album. Four stars, Mirage, number four. Right. Four left for me. They're all from the Buckingham Knicks era. We'll kick it off with my number four self-titled Fleetwood Mac, the White Album, I guess it's known as, I didn't know it was known as that, but apparently it is. I got it four and a half stars. I think, you know, Buckingham announces he is the man right off the bat with Monday Morning. His guitar work, it's, you know, right, you know, within 30 seconds or so of putting this album on, you know, he just brings this so unique style and he's not even like completely developed either. You know, he, on Rumors and Tusk and Mirage, I think he gets even better and more interesting. But he's just so good um, already. Uh, just some of the, the riffs and licks that he has, the playing, it's like lush sounding, it's unique sounding. And this is, you know, this is before they broke up. So you get a lot of Buckingham and Nick singing together, which is nice. I think McVie takes a step back as far as her songs, Warm Ways, uh, Over My Head, Say You Love Me, Sugar Daddy. I, I think they're all pretty good, um, but really I think Say You Love Me is the only one on here that I really love. Um, but I think Stevie comes in with Rhiannon, uh, Crystal, Landslide, I think are all fantastic. You know, it, it's just a, a really good, complete album. 
nobody's like getting too weird yet nobody's getting too like out there or witchy or anything like it just seems very cohesive and as far as like a, a track from one to 11 i think it it's flows better than even rumors does it all just seems very put together it's not quite at the same level songwriting wise it's a good album a little more 70s, a little less unique than they get on Rumors. Blue Letter kind of has that little Canyon, California, eagles -y sound, soft FM kind of stuff. But uh, they'd all get much better and I think stronger on Rumors, obviously, but I think it's a really great start. No growing pains, four and a half stars. Yeah. That is also my number four. I also have it at four and a half stars. And I mean, I, they come out of the gate super strong and I agree with Joe, like track, the way the record flows is, is really great. And I think in a lot of ways you could potentially argue that it's as good as rumors, except for a few reasons that it's not. First, I think is sonically. I think it's a very good sounding record. There's nothing wrong with the way this record sounds, but rumors to my ears, probably one of the five best pop rock records in terms of uh the sonic quality of it i think it just ridiculously good sounding record there's just a magic to the way that record sounds that isn't quite there on this record even though it still sounds very good secondly i think stevie nicks is really underutilized on this record she wrote three songs she only sings two uh rhiannon and landslide and like cram i don't like landslide that much um it's just not one of my favorite Stevie Nicks tunes. So really, Rhiannon is the only Stevie Nicks song here that I like, uh, in terms of her singing, at least. Crystal's fine, but uh, Lindsey Buckingham sings it. And lastly, I think this record does kind of fall apart a little bit at the very, very end. I don't think Sugar Daddy and I'm So Afraid really measure up to anything on the rest of this record or anything on rumors or anything throughout their like classic period. So I think it comes up just a tiny bit short, but having said all that, other than those things, I mean, great songs and, and a great precursor. You know, I, I think if you're in 1975 and listening to this, you're going, man, this is incredible. Uh, this new lineup is so good. These songs are great. I don't think, it would be possible to imagine that they would up the ante so much more even on the next record. Like it's unbelievable that they were able to, to take it that much further even because this is such a great record to begin with. So uh, good for them. I had that number nine and I'm sticking to that, but I also, I, I, I feel Joe's reaction, especially with like how much I love rumors like, I, I would objectively even say, like, it's not that far off from Rumors. I just don't know why I don't get the same feeling from it. So I, I kind of, I, I scoffed when you were mad at me for that, but I kind of, I get why you would react that way. It makes sense. It, you would, I think, understanding me for all of our long-term viewers would have just assumed that was top three for me. Um, but I still think it's good. It just never clicked with me. But Joe might be right. It might be because I have rumors. I don't need rumors light. So, you know, it's just how it is. But let's get to number three. We're in top three Fleetwood Mac territory. And I've got a four star record, a great album called Then Play On. I've got this higher than any one of us. I believe you guys have all talked about it. So my top three are going to be like all representing the different kind of um eras and lineups here this is like peter green masterpiece and i do think that shoe fits i think coming your way is a really cool newer vibe good percussion closing my eyes is awesome it's kind of dark and mysterious love the two guitar parts fighting for madge is great groove and playing great pace with like the bouncing bass and steady drums um i dig it in uh when you say at the end and picks up that's really cool showbiz blues is my favorite blues thing that I think they do to date with the claps and the slide guitar and the vocal performance you can really feel it album compared to the first two has just a much more creative atmosphere going on and mood simply done with the instrumentation the bass on this album I think really stands out and we have slighted so far in this video John McPhee and McFleetwood um, holding down the rhythm section 
Um, there's just too many all-stars in this historic lineup to give everyone their credit. Underway, I like a lot, really exploring the sound of the times a little more and more like psych rock with their style of jamming, really cool. One Sunny Day, I think as Joe was talking about, is badass. It kind of sounds like Dan Auerbach before Dan Auerbach. Like it's everything that like he loves about like that Delta revival. Rattlesnake Shake is awesome and heavy for its time. I love the drum sound on it. Without You is really cool, kind of sexy, great feel on the guitar. Searching for Maz, Ma searching for Madge has great jamming and soloing. My Dream is a pretty little song and creates a good album album dynamic coming at the end, just at the right time. My least favorite on it is Like Crying, but this album is just a really cool, a bit off the main pulse of what blues rock is, which I really like. It's kind of moody. So I'm giving it four stars. I think like if a band came out right now, a brand new band in 2022 and did this album, people would be like losing their minds and think it was so cool. So I got to give it four stars. I got to be on a clean slate, regardless of the times, four stars or then play on. Okay. I guess when you, when you put Fleetwood Mac at number nine, like, that doesn't matter, but I think it was the star rating that, that got me most of all. Three stars comparatively to rumors. It just doesn't doesn't compute, but you explained it well. My number three, and you little bitches, this, no, it's Tusk, all right? I'm not going to be the guy to put Tusk at number one. That's kooky talk. You guys keep acting like, oh, he's going to do it. You have like hinted at that on the channel before like when you did album of the years you were like it might be better than so like you can't blame us for thinking that well i said it might be because it's a five-star album but it's not it just doesn't have a cohesion that something like rumors does it doesn't have the absolute pinnacle peaks of something like rumors and it mostly comes down to stevie nicks on this because her contributions to tusk are very below par comparatively they're not terrible i think sarah and storms and sisters of the moon are fine but compared compared to like what buckingham's putting out there it's just not even in the same stratosphere i absolutely love the unhinged hissing lindsey buckingham on this the guitar work he does so interesting to me i just think it's incredible something like the ledge and, um, you know, that's enough for me. Uh, that's all for everyone. What makes you think you're the one? Which won my song of the year in 79? It's my favorite Fleetwood Mac song. I'm just going to come out and say it. I think it's just brilliant what he's doing. The kind of like tossed off nature of it almost. Like it's so far removed from rumors. But I think it's to its benefit that it is because you can't like you can't replicate rumors. They they had peaked there. They're never gonna be able to pull that off again. So you gotta go in, in some other direction. Buckingham was obsessed with the talking heads. He wanted something like cool and new. He thought, you know, rumors was already like too stodgy and too pop. So he gets really weird on this one. And I think it works so well. I think McVee's contributions over and over, I think is great. It's a not a good opener. And some of her other ones, Think About Me is good too, but I'm, I'm not with Cramser. I think the second half is weaker up until pretty much Walk a Thin Line and Tusk, I think are great. Tusk is another one where it's just so weird, like the paranoid group vocals, Buckingham's like hissing, is those like murmurs and kind of talking from the the USC marching band in the background who then kind of comes to life playing like the hook in this sort of like drowned out, like not full power marching band behind these like ramshackle drums and, you know, strong bass work. Like I, it was a top 10 song, which is insane to me because it's just so weird, but I think it's great. I think as far as like, weird albums go where everyone was sort of like doing their own thing and nobody really had any like cohesion at all it all works for me i think it's a really compelling listen and despite nick's not bringing her best stuff i think you know maybe i just really love Lindsay buckingham enough that his material on here really just takes to that five-star level 
I think it's great. I think it's a completely unique, interesting uh, listen. And really the only thing they could have done after rumors to like, not that it's on the same level, but to get a piece of art or piece of work or, or an album that has like enough to talk about it without it being like, oh, well, that's just rumors part two, or they just did rumors again, which they could have done but I give them credit for totally going the opposite direction and being super weird about it. And I love it. All right. My number three is Bear Trees. This is the uh, Welch and Kerwin era. And it is really a toss up between the classic era and this lineup as to which is my favorite. I, I just think Kerwin and Welch together are just so complimentary to each other. Writing wise and playing wise, some of their interplay on guitar is, is so cool. They both have really unique sensibilities and styles. I love Welch, who's always writing these kind of like jazzy, mystical type of tunes. And then out of nowhere, he'll just hit you with this really great hooky, poppy chorus. Um, and he does that all the time. I think a great example of that on this record is the track, The Ghost. Such a cool song. And also on this record, because you have Welch, and Kerwin, who are both so strong and so good, it doesn't feel like they're putting as much weight on Christine McVie here, uh, which I think allows her to thrive even more. Spare Me a Little of Your Love, I think, is a brilliant song. The guitar solo on it, I'm not sure which guitarist is playing it. Probably, I would have to guess Kerwin. I, I would think Kerwin, but maybe Welch. Uh, but man, what a killer guitar solo. Really cool. I don't know. I, I, I think it's a shame Kerwin was fired. I think it left him leaving left a little bit of an imbalance for several records. Uh, I think really not until Buckingham Knicks joined did they really find a, a, the same kind of uh, band synergy and balance that they had on, on these couple records with the two of them. I mean, it was only three years, <laughs> but it felt like a, a whole bunch of records in between. Uh, they were just kind of cranking them out. But man, for these couple records with the two of them together, I just think they were so fantastic together. Uh, four and a half stars for Bear Trees. Bear Trees is my number two. And one of the reasons why I love working for this channel, I had never heard of really or listened to this album before. And I think it's phenomenal. I've got it at 4.5 stars. I think it is really great. Jason pretty much said it all. Combination of the two guitarists, Kerwin and Welch, just makes for just some of the just best guitar playing pleasure you'll ever hear. Especially if you grew up with like hard rock classics and everything. You start to branch out with your guitar work and your guitar fandom and you find these little nuanced performances like this where it's all about feel and creativity and style. So cool. But let's also give a shout out to John McVie here. He is basing the hell out of the opener child of mine really good rock and opener with a lot of style especially in the vocals but the bass is thumping ghost is super cool maybe the first time we get reads in the Fleetwood Mac catalog homeward bound is pretty good there is a great solo on it sunny side of heaven the guitar work is just incendiary Joe's favorite adjective for guitar work bear trees the song has like that Fleetwood Mac rhythm that we know and love and really cool song in general Every song has great guitar playing. And Christy sounds, Christine sounds amazing on Spare Me a Little of Your Love, like Jason said. And I just think the songwriting and the guitar playing is just gelling so much here. And like Jason said, the Welch I really like, but the combination of him and Kerwin, so good. 4.5 stars. Number two, Bear Trees. All right, well, you guys are out discovering the Kerwin-Welch era. I'm over here thinking... What the hell, Braz? Because Mirage, apparently, now I have to consider one of the most underrated albums of the 80s. Because I just think it is a total masterpiece. It takes, you know, what Rumors did really well. You have Nick's with Gypsy, Straight Back, and That's All Right, which blow away anything that she had done since Rumors. Um, better than she'll do on Tango in the Night. I think better even than the self-titled. Um, and she was barely even there. It was basically Lindsay Buckingham like piecing her vocals together because she was so coked out, just out of her mind. 
but it, it works. He did a really great job with the production on this. I think Christine McVie's tracks on here, Love and Store, Only Over You, uh, Hold Me, which I think is her best song. Wish You Were Here, I think is a, a great closer. I think she nails sort of the, the drama and the, the, the power on that one. And then you have Buckingham. And I think his guitar work that he really showed what he could do on Rumors. He got kind of weird on Tusk that really percussive kind of cool acoustic sound. And I think he melds that on this one just perfectly with the more poppy elements. It doesn't have those like weird Tusk detours that turn people off. All of the songs that he's on playing that intricate, incredible style, like Eyes of the World and Empire State, they still work really well as pop songs. I think they meld really well with what Christine McVie's doing um, on Hold Me that like really, it almost sounds like he's playing a piano and it kind of like transforms into that cool solo at the end. And you know, maybe that's why I consider it a five-star album just because I can just listen to him play guitar forever. You know, even on a, on a weird track like Eyes of the World where he's doing that like hissing thing again, it turns into just this incredible guitar showcase for him. Um, and I just think it's fantastic. And I think the pop songs are great. Gypsy, Hold Me. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's five stars easily. And it didn't make my top five in 82, but I love 82 and it was, it was just off. But uh, I feel like this one just doesn't quite get enough uh, love, I guess, because I rarely hear it mentioned and Jason had it super low at three stars. Cramser at least had it at a very respectable four stars. So I don't know, but I think it's a masterpiece. They're unheralded, probably, um, I don't know, unheralded, five star, great album, five stars, 82. Love you, Lizzie Buckingham. I never in a million years would have imagined you would have Mirage ahead of Tusk, so blown each other's minds that's the just the fault of his narrative propaganda for tusk that we had last year so my number two is future games and man i don't think i had ever listened to this before and i absolutely love it i think it's so good coming after kiln house it gets a little folkier a little poppier too at the same time not really much of the blues left from the early era. They've pretty much fully moved on from that at this point. Uh, you got Welch's jazzy style, really haunting melodies that he writes uh, and pairing really well with the more bluesy Kerwin. Morning Rain is a fantastic uh, Christine McVie tune. Probably should have opened the record, I think. Uh, probably would have been a better opener. The title track by Welch is really awesome. I love the, the song Future Games. Uh, Kerwin's Sands of Time, I think, completely rules. It's got some really great jamming on it. Some really cool harmonized guitar leads as well. Sometimes is really, really killer with uh, great harmonizing vocally between uh, Welch and Kerwin. And great dueling guitar leads on that. Really cool solo. There's literally like literal filler where the, the label was like, we're not going to put this out with only seven songs. So you have to write another song. So they kind of like threw together this other jam called what a shame. So just that, and maybe a slight, slight tweak to the sequencing is all that really holds this from five stars for me because everything else on here, I think is absolutely phenomenal. I think the songwriting is really good and the performances are absolutely great. Really, really cool record. Uh, I love the sound of it. It's got that early 70s feel that I love. So it's a gem. Um, you know, wouldn't crack my top five in 71. It's just such a loaded year. Probably wouldn't even crack my top 10 in 71. But it might be just outside of my top 10. Just fantastic record. If you haven't heard it, it's definitely definitely a, a good one to check out. Okay, sanity is upheld. We have a trifecta. Yay. Uh, rumors. Jason and I both picked it as our winner for our album of the year series in 1977. If you haven't checked out those videos, you can. 
And we resequenced rumors. So we've talked about rumors quite a lot on the channel. So I won't bore everyone else to death with repeating ourselves, but this is just simply one of the best pop rock albums ever made. All of the songs are great. And you get a incredible variety of vibes and sensations and all of the drama that was going on backstage manifests itself into the songwriting. And even though it's entirely 100% motivated to be a radio friendly, huge hit pop masterpiece. I mean, how many albums are made that they're like, we're going to try to make an album where literally everything is radio ready and just huge pop, just knock it out of the park. It's like Babe Ruth calling your shot. It's incredible. To me, I, I don't know. There's so many things I love about this album, and you guys still have to talk about it. So I will say one thing that I really adore about this record is the sound and the playing of the drums because it makes it separate itself from all of the other pop stuff going on and all of the other like harder rock going on. It's got such a cool vibe and such a cool sound to it that it gives you rock rhythm and rock speed and rock tendencies at times, but never like is in your face crashing or giving you like those cock rock sexual blues, like, you know, coming at you. It's got a very distinct personality with the drums. I think it's very cool. Hats off to that. And I'll let you guys continue. Five stars, by the way, obviously. Yeah, it didn't win 77 for me. Denied the trifecta there but it is obviously a five-star album. It's virtually perfect. I would take off Oh Daddy and put on Silver Springs. I think that's the only thing that could make it better. Um, oh Daddy, I think, is the weak point. The only time on the album where I'm like, well, this could be better, because everything else is about perfect. Lindsey Buckingham's contributions right off the bat with Secondhand News, Never Going Back Again, uh, not quite. I kind of disagree with Kranzer because those, I don't think they're like super radio ready. I think they're basically perfect compositions, but they're, they're a little weirder. They're a little of that Lindsay Buckingham that we'll see on Tusk where it's not like a Monday morning where it's like Eagles kind of like FM gold. Like he, he's already starting to get a little weird with his acoustic textures and everything. But then, you know, he throws in something like Go Your Own Way, where it's just like made for radio, dreams made for radio, uh, the chain, you make loving fun, I don't want to know, Gold Dust Woman, like those are all just like instant radio hits, massive hooks on everything, perfect playing from everybody, uh, the chain, incredible drum work, uh, John McVie even gets to shine on there. And it's just such a cool, you know, it's a, it's a breakup album. All the kind of lovey doveyness of the, you know, Fleetwood Mac, White Album, just completely gone. You got Lindsey Buckingham making Stevie Nicks sing backups on a song, you know, basically just scorching her. And then you have Dreams where she's basically doing the same thing to him. And it's just, it's all the tension and the drama just turn it into, you know, a five-star, virtually perfect album. And yeah, it is, it is a masterpiece of form and 70s pop rock. So Jason, finish it off. Yeah, Rumors number one, Rumors Easy Five Stars uh, was my album of the year in 77. And I'll piggyback a little off of what Cram was saying about the drum sound. Some of my favorite recorded drums ever. Love the sound of the drums, love the sound of the bass. And they do have a, like this subdued, kind of sound to them but they have this amazing texture the low end has this great texture and it's staying out of the way and not only does it sound so good on its own like man those are great drum sounds but it's leaving so much top end room for everything else like the guitars and all the harmonizing and layering of vocals they can play so much with the arrangements without you know Mick Fleetwood going crazy playing symbols all over the place and just like splashing around and like you know mucking up the high end so sonically everything here just fits together like puzzle pieces it sounds unreal to me it, it sounds so good it's absolutely perfect this is where the bar is i think for for modern recording and sadly very few people ever come close to this 
And the songs are all amazing too, except for Don't Stop, which kind of sucks. Don't Stop is the weak link for me, but it also, I can't imagine the album without it because of just what the song is about and like how it kind of like, you know, when we did the resequencer, I had it closing. I think it would be better as a closer, but I think it just kind of brings everything together. I don't know. Like it's, it's part of the album in a big way and a part of their history, like in a big way. If they did stop, we wouldn't have Tusk or Mirage. I used to hate that song, but then like I, when I heard on the radio, it was like an automatic changer. Just like, nope, nope. But then I don't know when, maybe when I got the CD or something, and I like really listened to like every little detail and like the piano on it is just fantastic. And it kind of made me like it again. So I don't hate that song anymore, but I can see why people would find it a little like cloying and too sugary on a such a dark, twisted album. I do love Oh Daddy though. I, I really think that's a cool song. But there we go. Uh, that was about everything I expected. Quite a, quite a haul, a lot of records to go through. Any final thoughts? How, how we feel about Fleetwood Mac now? I respect them more, even, I mean, like I kind of hinted in the opening, like I only really knew like the five albums and I still considered them like one of the essential bands, like in, in you know, 70s and music history. And now that I've kind of filled out everything, I obviously think they're even greater because it's more than just the, the Buckingham Knicks era. They, you know, from the beginning, the different configurations and sounds, whether they were blues or folk or pop rock or, or whatever, just kind of impressive throughout their history that they were able to continue and constantly switch out these members and still kind of maintain I mean, it's not even like the same sound, but there's like some semblance of continuity throughout all of this, which is kind of hard to believe. Like I said before, I only knew like Joe, the, you know, the big five era, uh, the McVees and Fleetwood and Stevie and Lindsay. And I'm so glad we did the other stuff. But still nothing really came close to rumors for me, which is what I always think about. Sorry to beat a dead horse with Fleetwood Mac. So... You know, they're not a one album wonder by any means, but without rumors, they wouldn't get into my top 100, but they might, they might all time. It's tough. I mean, when you're talking about it and you've been listening to them, you know, twice at a time, and I did something different this time where I literally just listened to the album twice back to back. I usually go through and then go through again, but now I was like, just put it on again, make your notes. So, you know, right now I'm really high on them. That's just the problem with how great are they in your all time lists. Like when you start to really list the bands you love, you're like, oh, wow, I like 614 bands quite a lot. So would they be in my top 100? It's tough to say, but a much stronger route to that now that I know that I love, you know, this Kerwin Welch stuff and they've got a great record from the Peter Green era as well for me. So very good week for me. Yeah, this was one of my more enjoyable weeks in a while, I, even though like my star ratings were kind of spread out and kind of gradually went up as we went through. And I, I really enjoyed the whole process of listening to it. And I think with Fleetwood Mac, I think there's like really two narratives that kind of dominate the, the discussion of them. One is that they kind of only found their sound when Buckingham and Nick's joined. And that's the only era that matters. And then the other narrative is that like purists who will say they were a blues rock band and then they sold out and then they became poppy. And that's not true either. I think the, you really have to listen to all of it to get the full picture. There's really a, a, a long ride that they went through with all these different iterations and a big period in the middle where they weren't doing radio pop or the blues. That's very, very interesting and very cool. So uh, yeah, uh, just really cool, interesting history. But people are right that the post 80 stuff kind of sucks. So, all right. So let us know what you think of our lists, what your own lists are, how you rank the records. Be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you have not subscribed yet, hit the bell for notifications. You can find Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website in the description. 
And we will see you tomorrow for our top 10 favorite Fleetwood Mac songs. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.